I'd like to encourage you, if you would, to uh, open your Bibles to the uh, book of Galatians, and we'll, we'll be reading from that book, uh, chapter 1, verses uh, 6 through 10. Again, that's uh, Galatians, chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach another gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches another gospel to you, than what we have received, let him be accursed. For I do not know, for I do, excuse me, for do I now persuade men of God, or do I speak to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Good morning do have some that are visiting with us. We are so thankful that you are here. I would ask you to open up your Bibles. Turn to Ephesians, the fifth chapter is where we're going to begin in just a moment. Last week we talked about being born again. What the scriptures talk about from the idea of Philippians, the second chapter, about being like Jesus ultimately and, and following his example. And really I'd like to continue that same thought this morning. The idea of whether or not we are always his, or if it's sometimes we're his, if we're striving to serve him, or if it's just something that we know that there's some things that we need to do, so from time to time we will pray, from time to time we'll sing the songs that are, that are led, we'll read the Bible if we have to prepare for a class, or we'll open the Bible when we get to class, all these different pieces that we can kind of get caught up into. And kind of forgetting the reality of this relationship that we are to have with him. This walk that you and I are on. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, there are three walks. I just like to point out to you quickly. That we are striving to be on. It's learning to walk. You've been born again. You have to learn to walk. What do we do? How do we do this? Ephesians, the fifth chapter, begins by saying you need to imitate God. You need to imitate God as beloved children. And walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice of God as a fragrant aroma. We need to learn how to walk in love. How do you learn to walk in love? How can you read 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and realize that that kind of love is what I'm supposed to have for everyone? That I am striving to be patient, to be kind in every aspect of my life. Not because people necessarily deserve it, but because that's what my God does. That's what my Father did and does. Because I'm imitating Him, and I'm walking in love, and the great example that's given in Ephesians, the second chapter and verse 2, as Jesus. Jesus did this. So you and I are to walk in love. He'll go on in verses 3 and 4, and really into 5, and tell you what that means. You need to understand that there's certain things that you have got to stop. It can't be caught up in immorality. You can't get caught up in greed. Silly talkies, he talks about. Coarse jesting. The idea of not being an immoral person, impure, coveting. But that you are loving one another. As our Savior loved one another. As we go through this, I want you to remember the term walk. The idea that this is a constant step forward. You are continuing to walk. This is a learned thing. That you and I are to do. And it never stops. As we are striving to imitate God. And to walk in the love of Jesus Christ. How do I do that? How do I become always his? You know what's interesting as you continue forward here. You get down to verses 5 through 13. And he tells us you need to make sure that you're walking in the light. And I want you to notice this as we go through this. Is the idea that unless you read His word, unless you get to know who Jesus Christ is, unless you understand the difference between light and darkness, you can't walk in it. We can't truly walk 
in something unless we understand what it is. And that never stops. That's the idea as he continues on in 14 through 21 and says you need to walk in wisdom. You can't walk in wisdom if you don't have knowledge. You can't walk in wisdom if you don't have knowledge. If you don't read his book, if you don't pray to him or talk to him, if you don't associate with like-minded people that are striving to be his children, striving to walk in this manner, you can't be his child. You cannot do this walk. So it's something that's so unbelievably important for all of us. We can talk about this last week, about being born again. The idea is, is, has come to is the idea that you're just simply being baptized, and it's bigger than that. But that's the start. You're being born again to a new hope, that you're living this new life, and you're on this walk. What happens when you stop that walk? What happens when you're not walking in love? What happens when you're not walking in light or in wisdom? What are we supposed to do? What do you do? What if you're sitting in love? Or walking backwards in light, which isn't a thing. The idea of not making sure, making sure that we are continuing to go forward. I, I suggest to you, one of the things that happens very quickly is that we fail to realize why we do this walk. My walk with God in love, light, and wisdom has very little to do with you. And that's not a bad thing. It is seen in my action towards you. It's seen in the application of those things. But this is about me imitating God and me having the love of Jesus. And therefore, I'm going to go out and act like him. And you're going to do the same. And if we all do that, we're all going to benefit from that as God's children. So certainly there is a no, there's no question that there's going to be things that are done for man. But it's not because I want you to glorify me. Or I want you to praise me. Or shouldn't be. This is about the idea of everything that I do, whether or not I'm doing this for God. Over in Galatians, the first chapter, the verses that were just read to us, the Apostle Paul dealt with this. Why was he teaching these things? Why are you doing these things, Paul? And Paul tells them, look, it's amazing to me that you're already leaving the gospel. How quickly you are deserting it. Somebody's come along and they've taught you something different and you're already following something else. You're disturbed, he says. They're disturbing you. I want you to notice verse 8. The apostle Paul says, I don't care if we, the apostles, or an angel, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. It doesn't matter who teaches you these things. It doesn't even matter if it's an angel from heaven. Let him be accursed. But the other aspect of this is, don't follow it. You as a priest... Me as a child of God need to know what his book teaches, what the gospel is. So yes, the person who does something or teaches something in wrong is going to be accursed, but so am I if I listen to it and follow it and apply it because you know what I'm not doing? I'm not walking in wisdom. I'm not walking in light. I'm not continuing to grow as I should. Over in Colossians, the third chapter, the difficulty sometimes comes down to just wanting to be seen. I'm not sure when this occurred in human history when it comes to the church. But there is a mindset for some that if you're not standing up in front of the group, you're not doing work for God. And that is 100% wrong. That's the idea of me reading this in Colossians, the third chapter, and verse 23, and say, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And me saying, no, it's not. I want people to see me. Now, I understand as the one who gets up here all the time that there's irony in that. But again, I'm not up here or shouldn't be up here as a preacher because I want to be seen by man. Matter of fact, I don't want you to see me. I want you to see his word. I want you to see him. That relationship that you can have with him, that I can have with him. But there are some, if we're not careful, that are at least tempted, if not 
fall into the fact that they want to be seen by other people. I want to stand before the group. I can't do that. And therefore, I'm not doing any work. You are absolutely wrong. It is amazing how many things in our walk with him that we are striving to serve only him. He's the only one that sees it. He's the only one we're concerned about seeing it. That's not for everybody. The Pharisees, it says, believed Jesus, but in essence, they were men pleasers. They wanted, they wanted the, the, the people to see them and to fall down and worship them, in essence, and to follow them. There are people that fall into that category. There's a quote says this, we ought not to be weary of doing little things for the love of God who regards not the greatness of the work but the love with which it is performed. That doesn't mean to say that there's not great things that are going to be done. It does mean that God weighs the motive. He understands the why. Why am I doing these things? Why are you doing these things? Am I truly walking for him? Am I doing these things to bring glory to God? Or is this just for myself? Matthew, in his account, he's talking about the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus makes this emphatically clear. You let your light shine. Why? So people will glorify God. It's not about you. It's not about me. Sometimes the difficulty is this idea that you and I are walking with Jesus and we want people to see us. We've got to get people to see him. This is all about seeing him. In my relationship with him, that we are united with him. Not because you are absolutely nothing, it's because he is absolutely everything. He is God. And I am his child. In every facet of our life, are we allowing people to see Jesus? While we handle certain situations, do we allow people to see him? Do we show love? To people that do not deserve love. Because guess what? That's what happened to me. Are we willing to shine our light bright around those who are filling this void that they have with everything but what will fit in that void, which is Jesus? And you may be the one to bring them to him. Are we growing in our wisdom of his? One of the greatest things to me when it comes to the scriptures is that this is not very difficult. We understand the relationship aspect of God. We understand this in every other relationship that we will have. If you never talk to your spouse, never, I don't care how good you think that is, it's not a good relationship. We understand this in every other facet of life. A few weeks ago, we talked about the idea of these love letters. God has given us this, this amazing love letter, beautiful letter to his children and we can read it or back in the old days when we used to get love letters now it's probably like texts that people send you would keep them and then later on you'd embarrassingly find them but you'd keep them why and from time to time if you were still with that person you'd read them you didn't want to just get a love letter and then like thanks throw it away as tyler was talking about in class Thanks for the proposal. But the reality is, we read them because they mean something to us. That's what this book is. If you're not reading this book, you very, very seriously need to consider your relationship with him. Because this is written to you. This is your walk with God. Your walk with God does not necessarily have anything to do with my walk with God. Though they can inter interact, of course. We can encourage one another. But this is your relationship with him. How would you describe your relationship with him? Or are you simply just caught up in a mindless routine? This is just what we do. I want you to think about this question for a minute. When do you feel the closest to him? When do you feel the closest to him? When we're worshiping God, when do you feel the closest to him? Just here. Songs? Prayer, Lord's Supper, very few are going to say giving, probably. Is that when we feel the closest to him? 
What about just in our daily lives? Maybe it's like Psalm 23, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you're with me. But you know what David's not saying? You're also with me every other time. He's not saying that that's not the case. He's just specifically talking about when I'm going through difficulties. But sometimes people get close to God when they're going through difficulties. What about you? When do you feel the closest to him? When I sing songs and praises to God, you can feel that. When I pray to him, you feel it. When I partake of the Lord's Supper, 100% should feel it. But the reality is, we should always feel close to him. Those things encourage us and keep us going. But when I think about Jesus Christ, it is not something that just pops in my head like, oh, I remember that guy. He is never far from my mind. Because we're told that everything that we do, whether in word or deed, is to be done in his name. Even to the point of taking every thought captive, Paul says. On this walk, it's understanding him. That when you walk through this life, you are not walking alone. One of the difficulties, I think, sometimes is truly understanding this. Over in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, the Hebrew writer puts it this way as he's quoting from the Old Testament, beginning in verse 5. He says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, what will man do to me? How many of us fall into this we category? We can confidently say, he will never forsake me, he will never desert me, he is my helper, I will not be afraid. I suggest to you, the question, what will man do to me, a lot of us have a whole list of answers to that. So we're not confident that we are walking every step of the way with God. Everything we do. We come into his presence as a group this morning, no question, to worship his high and holy name. But it's understanding that my relationship with him, I am always with him, or rather, he is always with me. This relationship that we have. I know this because over in 1 John, the fourth chapter, he tells us, the idea of this relationship piece is so powerful. First John, if you're members here, you know that I, my love for this book. But in First John, it's very clear that one of the words that is used time and time and time again is abiding. This idea of this, this unification, this abiding that we have in him and he in us. And this is no different here in First John, the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 13. By this we know that we, have, we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. We, we have come to know and have believed the love which he has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. The opportunity that you and I have is not simply to say that we have a Savior. That one day I can be with him for eternity, which is absolutely correct. Those of us that are living the life now, he abides in you now. And you in him. That is awesome. That changes the way that you live. Or it should. That changes your perspective of what God is willing to do for you. That changes your mindset of whether or not you truly believe that God deserts you. And some of you, I think, probably have struggled with that or are struggling with that. Where are you, God? Why am I going through these things? All the different questions and all the different situations that we find ourselves in. And the very one that can help us through those things, so often we're the ones that turn around and instead of being confident to know he's standing there, that he's with us, we turn on him. Where are you, God? I'm right here. I'm standing right next to you. One of my favorite illustrations of this is when Peter walks on water. How did he get back into the boat? How did he get back into the boat? In my mind, it was hand in hand with Jesus. 
Jesus got him back into that boat. It's the same thing for you and I. When we go through these horrible things in our lives, or the good things, it is Jesus Christ who is with us. Doesn't mean you're not going to go through them. It means you're going to go through them with the great Savior and creator of all, all things. It means you're going to go through it with your Father, who's the ultimate judge and who, by definition, is love. Who loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you just to give you the opportunity to be his child. Just to give you the opportunity to whether or not you believe in him. That's how much he loves you. When you go through difficulties, and you will. The greatest thing that you possibly can do, if you're not, by the way, right now, is to build this relationship as strong as you possibly can make it with him. Continue always to build it. I'm always amazed when Joseph in the Bible turns around and he looks at his life and he realizes, as it talks about throughout the time, that God was with him in the pit, in prison. That would be not, I don't think that's my perspective necessarily. This was God's will. God is with me. He's taking care of me in prison, in Potiphar's house. All the different things that he goes through. And it's the understanding that it is God that's getting him somewhere and teaching him things that he's going to be able to save the people. And it's the same for you and I. The question is whether or not we truly listen or think of it that way. I want you to consider, we started off this lesson with the idea of it always being his always being his but the difficulty sometimes is this is a question for you and for me the reality is that's not true are you always his Romans the 14th chapter will talk about as it gets down towards the end about this idea that what no matter what we do is for the Lord there he's talking about opinion things but it's for the Lord we're his you and I though As we walk through this life, are we putting everything through that relationship? Everything through that relationship. Isn't it isn't the idea that whatever I do in order to do all in the name of the Lord, that I say I'm doing this in the name of the Lord. That's not the point. The point is to understand that I am walking and taking every step with understanding of how this affects my relationship with the Creator of all things. And I assure you, no matter how confident you are, we talked about this in the Thursday class, no matter how confident you are in your relationship with God, every single person on the day of judgment is going to fall to their knees before him because of who he is. You can be confident where you go, but you're going to fall flat on your face, and so am I. Understanding who he is, the scariest thing to me is that there are going to be people that fall down before him that know full well that I was not living for him. They're going to confess him, as we talked about last week, that he is the Lord and it's going to be too late. You have the opportunity, I have the opportunity now to get our life right with him. Don't wait. If you have not become his child, as we talk about so often, there's so many different pieces that you are missing. Because I'm going to tell you, one of the most amazing things to me when I've had Christians say this, I go through a lot of difficulties as a child of God. Things are so much smoother when I'm not living that life. You're crazy. Every single person on this earth is going to go through difficulties. The question is, are you going to go through them alone, or are you going to go with, through them with God? There may be different difficulties, but everybody's going to go through them. Who are you going to blame then? You and I have the opportunity to have a relationship with the creator of all things, with our Father, but it's your choice. It's my choice. If you have not obeyed the gospel, now's the time. There's a reason why the gospel is the good news. It happened at Calvary, and it's the opportunity for you and I to be his child. If you're not living your life from the standpoint of always being his, I encourage you to really, really think about that. 
Check on your relationship with him. I tend to always use Facebook when it comes to this. Jesus is not intending to be your acquaintance. He's not intending for you to be able to unfollow him through this life, as you can on Facebook. It's not the idea that we were friends 15 years ago, and I haven't talked to you since, but now we're friends. This is the closest relationship you ought to have on this earth. Are we living that life? Are we striving to live that life? If not, please take care of that now. As always, continue to pray for one another. We are here to help one another. But a lot of that comes down simply to whether or not I'm willing to ask. But our Savior knows to pray for one another. But if there's anything that we can do for you now, I ask you to please come as we stand and sing.